morning. Good morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to City Temple. It's so good to look out there and see your smiling faces this morning. We want you to join in with us. This is a participatory service as we sing our, our song that we always sing and that begin our worship, Sabbath rest. Hopefully the words will be on the, the screen so you can follow along with us. Said I would decide to leave our cares behind on this day of Sabbath. On this your holy, on this your holy day, we've come to give you praise on this day. him at his footstool, for he is holy. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the blessing of this day and for enabling us to come together to worship you, to lift up the name of Jesus. We invite your friends to be with us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our morning hymn can be found on page 537 in your hymnal. We ask that you uh, look in the front of your pew. There should be a hymnal in front of you and share with those that may not have one in front of them. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, hymn number 537.
Spare time at City Temple. All of us have people that we know that we need to pray for, don't we? And if you have a silent request, just raise your hand. Someone in your life that you want to pray for today, just raise your hand. Heaven sees it, and we're going to pray for it openly, your silent request. And what I'm going to ask today is that right where you are, let's just kneel together. Just where you are. You want to come down front, just kneel right where you are if you can. If you can't kneel, just sit there. And we're going to offer a word of prayer right from the desk today. Let's do that. Precious 
your name up today because you're worthy to be praised. You're an amazing God. You're an awesome God. And you are always there every time we need you and even when we don't think we need you. You're still there. So Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your provisions. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we confess that we're not worthy because we still have sin in our lives and we still do things, Lord, that are unseemly. We still say and do things that cause hurt and pain to each other. We still think wrong things and do wrong things because we're intentional in our pursuits. So, Lord, now we ask that you would forgive us for our sins and our mistakes. We ask, Lord, that you would take away those sins and for the ugliness and the evil that we have in our hearts and minds and that you would cast it away. Lord, we your people came today because we need to worship and to praise and to thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this week and for bringing us to another Sabbath so that we can give you the due that you and only you have the glory, the praise, and the honor. Lord, we have some of us among us who are sick. We have some in the hospital. We have some who have died and who families are bereaved. Lord, we ask that you would look in on them, and that you would comfort them. When many people came to church today, they were challenged with physical ailments, and they considered not coming today because of pain, whether it was physical, mental, or emotional. So, Lord, I ask today now that you would relieve that pain and suffering. I would ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand that you're coming soon, and that we need to make decisions and choices now to follow you all the way. We don't have time, Lord. Tomorrow is not promised. The next moment isn't promised. And so, Lord, we ask that we would choose you as we submit and surrender our wills to yours. We realize, Lord, that we can't go to heaven alone and that we have to be an adequate witness according to what we study in the Sabbath school. That we have to proclaim to the world that Jesus is coming again and he's coming soon. We don't have time to wait. The lesson that they said, said, Lord, we need to go. So help us to understand what we're studying. And then, Lord, help us to put it into practice when it says go. It's so comfortable to be in a padded seat. It's so comfortable when it's 90 degrees outside to be in the air conditioning. But it's so much better to prepare to go to heaven and do what is necessary to move the gospel forward. So Lord, we ask you to help us to not be convenient, comfortable Christians. To not be Christians who love to be in a comfortable situation, sitting in a place where we're just waiting for you to come. But this is the time now where we need to get out and move this gospel forward. We ask, Lord, that you would be in our worship service, that the verses we read and the songs that we sing will lift you up in your, all your glory and praise. We ask a special blessing on our speaker for the hour, and that you would wrap him in your Holy Spirit, 
and that the words that he speaks will be from on high, and that we can clearly see and accept Jesus as he is. Lord, help us today. We have nowhere else to turn to. We have nowhere else to go today but here in your presence. So be with us today. Give us what we need collectively and individually as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask a special blessing on our congregation, those who are here and those who are somewhere else. Be with our pastor, Lord, as he is away. Give us the blessings that we need, Lord. We ask all these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let everyone say together, Amen. Amen. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. If you're following the bulletin, our music ministry says Leisha Sadler. However, Leisha had an accident, but she sent two special people in her stead, and we are so thankful. We're going to be provided a music ministry by Ken Roy Robinson, who is an excellent musician, and the second one, Roy Sadler who is Leisha's husband. So let's welcome them, church.
Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, City Temple. It's a good day today, isn't it? Maximum of 81 degrees, they said. So I'm good. Not humid. And uh, it's so good to be here uh, this morning. Um, many of you are wondering where the pastor is, but he did announce last week what his agenda was going to be. And I think it's going to be a good one, a very good agenda, simply because he is preparing to permanently be with us. That was sort of weak. I expected to see people jumping up and down in the aisles and saying hallelujah. But he has been faithful. He has been driving back and forth once and sometimes twice a week to do and perform his pastoral duties uh, for us. And we really appreciate it. And so uh, we're standing in for him today, but um, we expect to see him back on July 17th. He's taking a little vacation, and then he's trying to gather up his things and meet us here on July 17th. What a day of rejoicing that will be, I'm sure, for him as well and his family. So pray for them and make sure that God would bless him and be uh, helpful to them as they uh, make their transition. Just a few announcements. Uh, we are still planning for homecoming. Mm, that was weak as well. Um, I would really like for people to come home. I'd like for family members to come home. I'd like for friends I used to know to come home. I'd like for people I don't know to come home. I want everyone to come home the weekend of August 3rd through the 5th. The committee is meeting. They're planning a wonderful program starting with Friday Vespers, uh, Sabbath service. Uh, we're planning lunch. We're planning Vespers, uh, Sabbath afternoon, and a Sunday fellowship uh, cookout or church picnic. And we want everyone to come. This is going to be in uh, uh, Lower Huron Metro Park. So we want everyone to be there. How many of us? We want everyone to be there. And if you're looking for a ride, uh, we're going to see if we could put a sign-in sheet in the church office. Uh, and you just sign up saying you need a ride. And we will try to work that out for you so that everyone, how many? Everyone can attend. And it will be a great blessing to all of us. Um, do we have any visitors here today? Anybody visiting? Amen, amen. Could you just stand and... Amen, amen. Now, I thought I saw some people who I haven't seen for so long. I might want to classify you as visitors. Uh, Sister Bailey is here. Welcome back. Have you been overseas? Oh, where? Japan. Japan. She probably can speak the language by now, huh? <laughs> well, thank you and welcome back. Welcome back. And as we uh, welcome one another uh, at this time, just uh, ask God's blessing on this service and those you shake hands with. Just welcome one another, and we'll have a few other announcements following that. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I'm a friend of you, cause me friend. 
Of course, it's good to see Sister Jones again. She may as well just come back up here and move on back to City Temple. Angela Maddox is here, I understand. Can you, can you stand and... There she is. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have a couple more announcements. Before I forget this, there will be... Um, a repast downstairs after service today. So that means we can stay and eat and fellowship a little bit longer. Vacation Bible School is about to start. And we have an announcement from our children's ministry leader regarding Vacation Bible School. Pay particular attention to her announcement. Good morning, church. Are you ready for our children's evangelistic effort this summer? In the past three years, we have traveled to Mount Everett in Asia to discover God's mighty power. We've traveled to Egypt to visit Joseph and experience his journey from the pit to the palace. Last year, we traveled to Rome to worship with Paul and the underground church. Well, this summer, you are in for a treat. Get your suitcases ready. We are traveling all the way to ancient Babylon to witness Daniel's courage. During Babylon Vacation Bible School, 
families will go back in time to discover firsthand the story of Daniel's courage. From his capture in Jerusalem to his trial in the fiery furnace to his miraculous rescue from a den of lions. With amazing music, Bible time crafts, and Daniel as our Bible teacher, each moment of Babylon will focus on what matters most, God's amazing love. Our kids will leave the city of Babylon each day knowing that God is with them when things change, when they need help, when they're afraid, when they're lonely, and when they're thankful. It is our prayer that our Babylon Vacation Bible School will allow God's word to come to life like never before, touching lives, changing hearts, and drawing children closer to Christ. In a world that's ever-changing, there are times when we feel alone. But in this world, God is with us. He's in our lives wherever we go. And we will not be afraid, for God is with us all the way. We will stand firm and strong, and this will be our song. Through it all, God is faithful. Through it all, our God is true. He never fails, never changes when we rise or when we fall. God is with us through it all. Won't you pack your suitcases and join me in battle? Happy Sabbath. You know, in our lesson study this week, it talked about us uh, being witnesses. So how many of you are witnesses? Witnesses for Jesus, I'll preface that. Very good, very good. You know, in the word it says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have ye robbed thee? And tithes and offerings. And you say, Elder Taylor, what does being witnesses have to do with the tithe and offerings? Well, Jesus was a giver. He gave his life that we may have eternal life. And the least we could do is give back in our tithe and offerings. Would the officers please come forth? Father in heaven, we're truly thankful for your son Jesus who died on the cross for all of us that one day we all can be together in unity giving to one another. Lord, we are so blessed. We're truly blessed. And sometimes, Lord, we just forget about that. Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to touch each one even now. Continue to woo us. Press upon our hearts to know that this is your temple. Lord, this cool air, 
is because of your blessings. And Lord, there's a part that all of us has to play in this. And when we complain, Lord, we need to ask, what have I done to help? What have I done to contribute to stay cool and calm, to be warmed in the wintertime? Lord, you take care of us. Help us to do our part. Thank you, Lord. We're not deserving. In Jesus' name, amen.
for scripture reading by Jalil Rudolph. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today I'll be reading from Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. I again, I repeat again, Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Please say amen when you got it. Let our conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. And what man shall do unto me, he shall do unto me. May the Lord add a rich blessing in hearing and reading to the doing of his word. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. So happy to be here this morning. Feel like a ram in the bush, but God is good. Pray with me as um, I talk about how real God is in our lives. There are some things I may not know. There are some places that I may not go. But I am sure of this one thing. My God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. My God is real, He is real in my soul. Yes, my God is real, for He has washed and made me whole. His love for me is just like your groom. Yes, my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. I cannot tell just how it felt. When Jesus washed all my sins away. But since that day, yes, since that very hour, God has been real, for I can feel His mighty power. Yes, my God is real. He's real in my soul. Yes, my God is real. For he has washed and made me whole. And his love for me is just like your gold. Yes, my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. Yes, my God is real, He's real in my soul. 
Yes, my God is real, for he has washed and made me whole, and his love for me is just like your gold. Yes, my God is real, for I can feel him in my ask the church to pray with me and for me as I attempt to give to you what I think God wants me to give to you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being God and being a just God. Father, but when being just meant that we as the human race would be lost forever, you gave us mercy and you gave us grace. We thank you for giving us Jesus who who gave the greatest gift of all and sacrificed his life for us that we might obtain the life and that we might have life in abundance. Now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Well, last Wednesday was the 4th of July. I don't think I'm revealing anything to anyone here. Uh, We all know that that was Independence Day. Maybe some of the young people don't know why it was a holiday. But uh, way back when, the United States of America, or the colonies at that time, declared their independence from Britain. So we became one nation, and we became one nation under God. Spirit of Prophecy says that the Lord has done more for the United States than for any other country upon which the sun shines. Here he provided an asylum for his people where they could worship him according to the dictates of conscience. Here, Christianity has progressed in its purity. The life-giving doctrine of the one mediator between God and man has been freely taught. God designed that this country should ever remain free for all people to worship him in accordance with the dictates of conscience. He designed that its civil institutions in their expansive productions should represent the freedom 
of gospel privileges. The spirit of prophecy goes on and says, I have been shown that Satan is stealing a march upon us. The law of God through the agency of Satan is to be made void. In our land of boasted freedom, religious liberty will come to an end. This country was formed for the purpose of having religious liberty. But we also know, according to the spirit of prophecy, that this religious liberty will come to an end. But this was the perfect place for God to set up and we have enjoyed religious freedom to this point. Now, the devil has been doing a job on us for a long time. Right here in America, we see what's going on around the world. But right here in America, he's corrupted every good thing. Every good thing. But I wanna, what I want to talk about a little bit today is finding peace and contentment and health in all of this. I believe that we can find peace no matter what. As I was watching the news last week, I really got tired of hearing all of the things that were, were going on. In fact, it almost seemed like, you know, while, while one reporter is speaking and telling us something, they say, wait a minute, let's interrupt this and let's go to something else. And I'm still trying to digest what they were saying before. Uh, we interrupt this to bring you something worse. And while I'm listening to that, one day they interrupted again and brought something they thought was more important and worse. And on and on and on. I don't know about you. Uh, I know everybody says, well, every generation has its own troubles and problems. But in today's multimedia environment, we can see everything as it unfolds. Sometimes the cameras get there before the activity actually takes place. And they start showing everything. And we look and we say, Lord, what, what's next? And we see the volcano running down the mountains and burning up trees and homes. And we see active shooter situations going in and firing on the actual reporters who are trying to report the news. And then we see it turn to something else like a soccer team getting lost in a cave. And then when they find them, they're trapped by water and can't get out. I don't know about your blood pressure, but mine is raising right now just talking about this. All of the things that the devil is trying to do to distract us and cause us to have fears and anxieties and frustrations and problems. So what do we do? How can we find peace? Amidst all of this, how can we find contentment? 
I just began to think and say, what would my life be like if I didn't have or know God? How can I absorb all of this without knowing God and didn't have a relationship with him and trust his word? What would I do if one of these incidences impacted my life? On a personal level, what would I do? What can I do? It causes me pain, anxiety, stress. How could I even think about what I am going to do if I didn't know God? the one true God. But based on a lot of what I'm hearing in the media, and I know we all are, we have it programmed on our phones. We hear a beep. It's not a text. It's just telling you what happened in the world. And on and on. But a lot of what I'm hearing from these individuals being interviewed is that apparently they don't know God or don't trust in him. That's the impression I'm getting. So in this dark world, how can we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians Smile and be content. Do we handle all of these issues by just trusting God? Can we do that? Knowing the beginning of the Bible from the end, most of us know how this all is going to wrap up. But we need peace. We need contentment. Those two things can lead us to health. I was doing some reading about marketing and how to market services to people or products to people. And it seems that it seems to conclude that people remember negative things that happen to them in their lives more than they do the positive. So if you apply this concept in life in general, when we look at the devil's purpose, He wants to hit us with as many negative experiences as he could find. And he's found quite a few. People seem to always remember the negative things that happened to them rather than the positive. People tend, for example, to vote against a candidate rather than for a candidate. We would rather vote for somebody we don't even know rather than vote for somebody we don't like. We make decisions based on passion or fear. We make our decisions based on those things. And we've been properly trained by the prince of this world to do these things. So just looking at passion, 
We're talking about pride, we're talking about lust, we're talking about envy, we're talking about greed, anger, gluttony, even laziness is a passion. And we make our decisions based on these, and you can sell anybody, anything, if you appeal to one of these passions. And the devil knows this. He's always trying to address our anxieties and our fears. He watches the things that we're afraid of, the things that cause us issues. He watches these things and he tries to appeal to them. Marketers have also perfected this process. For example, in any in industry or business, what kind of industry or business do you think would do well based on fear and anxieties, all of our fears and anxieties? What industries would thrive? Home security, insurance, health, and hospitals, these will all thrive just based on our fears. We don't want to be caught without health care. We don't want to be caught without insurance. We don't want to be caught with a weak security system. We don't want to be caught. So therefore, industries will thrive. But let's say you want to, you're a seller of cosmetics. What would you appeal to? Fear and anxiety or passion? You're selling cosmetics. What will you, what will, you, what will the, you want to appeal to in individuals. Some say passion, but some say fear. You can appeal to both because who wants to be told they smell bad? Does anybody hear or look bad? Who wants to be told that? On the other hand, who would like to be told that they smell great and look attractive. So you can appeal to both in that situation. You know, I, I may have told this story before in terms of anxiety. Uh, a while ago, when my oldest son was just a few years old, somehow we got into a conversation. And I asked him, I said, what is the thing you fear the most? What is the thing you fear the most? And I was expecting him to say something like dying or getting really deathly sick or, uh, you know, standing up and speaking in front of people or something like that. But you know what he told me? He said, and this is when the young people used to fill up the balconies, and he said, what, would, what scares me the most is coming in with a crowded balcony and walking across the front of them and tripping and falling. That was his anxiety. That was his fear what he feared the most. I was asked to do a, a talk, and I may, have, I may have mentioned this to some of you, but I was asked to do a talk at a, at a school. It was a middle school. I think it went up to the eighth or ninth grade. 
And I was doing a talk on the importance of vitamin D, the importance of getting enough vitamin D, you know, growing strong, healthy bones and having good hormone balance and, and all of that because of vitamin D. We need vitamin D. But in the northern climates, during certain times of the year, you can't even get enough sunshine as the source of converting the vitamin D in your skin. So I was talking to them. I said, well, during these times of the year, you need to go out and get some sun. Talking to a group, mostly uh, young girls. And they began to look at me like, what is he talking about? Going out getting more sun. And I said, and I noticed the looks on their faces. It was like I was telling them to do something that was so ridiculous. So I said, well, what's wrong? What, did I say something? And they said, nobody want to be going out there getting in all that sun. And I said, oh, really? How come? Doesn't getting in the sun make you darker? And I said, well, in some cases, you may get a little tan if you stay out there long enough, but you only need 15 minutes a day. Nobody want to be darker. And I said, oh. And I, and I began to inquire more. And it turned out that their idol was people like Beyonce and Alicia Key and you know, all the bright skinned people that they were striving for, they were fighting against nature in order to do this, and it was their fear to be darker. You never know what young people and adults have inside of them that has been put there by society for us to become more anxious and be afraid and not have what we want. That amazed me. I learned something that day. No matter what I told them. And they were not that dark. But they didn't want to get darker. That was their fear. Our society has programmed us to want certain things because it appeals to either our fears and anxieties or our passions. Who do you think is behind all of this? Who do you think has hijacked our society and caused us to have such stress and fear and frustration and disappointment to be this downcast and, and anxiety and depression. This epidemic in our society that's causing us to do things that are not important in our lives. We know it's Satan. And we can actually say that in many cases we're helping him out. How did he get us to do some of the things that we do? And how can he be successful attacking us this way? The answer seems to be simple, and that is by us not staying close to Christ. Studying his word, following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, if we don't do those things, then the devil is able to succeed in our lives. You know, life used to imitate art. 
You know, the best artists would spend hours trying to perfect a realistic view of life. That was their goal. To imitate reality, to imitate what life was all about. Now it seems that it's the other way around. We are imitating art. We imitate art. We try to do what we see. What we see the entertainers doing, what we see the athletes doing, what we see the actors doing, our sense of what is realistic and reality has become confused. Who do you think is responsible for that? Our sense of right, our sense of truth has become muddy and murky. Every imagination that some sick, immoral individual can come up with and put before our eyes, we want to emulate. These reality type shows. How many of you remember soap operas? Don't be ashamed. I remember them. One Life to Live and General Hospital. and Those were actually reality shows before we got the real reality shows. Now we have reality shows where you can go into people's houses and watch them live and see what's important to them. And you turn around and try to do that. Do you realize that this is happening? It is amazing. And we have to watch ourselves because we end up wanting it all. We want everything. And so because we can't get it, the anxiety and the frustration and the depression comes into our lives. And now we have a problem. But the wisest man in the world said, the wisest man that ever lived said, all of this is vanity. All of this is vanity. And he concluded in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Of course, sometimes it seems life hits us with something that we really didn't have a whole lot to do with or a lot of control over. Sometimes we might get some sort of disease. And then the announcement is made, well, Brother Penny has this dreaded disease or some other person has a disease, let's pray for them. Or, uh, or they, they, they lost their home, or they uh, had an accident, or they have some issue. And you say, wait a minute. It's like you wake up one morning, and all of a sudden you get caught in this snare of life. And there's nothing you can do because it happened to you. Many of us today, as we sit here, have an issue. Many of us have 
a concern, a real concern, something that is affecting our mental health. We try to hide it, but we're really worried about something, and it's making us anxious. And when we're faced with all of this stress, if our bodies are not prepared to handle it through being healthy to start with, and we're already broken down, that additional stress can just break us. That is, if we don't know God, and if we don't trust him. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 says this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers in, of darkness in, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have so many promises in the word of God that will help us The spirit of prophecy also has instruction for us. And this is one thing that is said. It says that God will never leave us or forsake us. Whether we have no job, whether creditors are calling, whether our health is failing, whether a loved one dies, especially when they were not that old, whether you were mistreated as a child, just can't seem to get ahead in life, the formula is clear. We need to first practice a healthy lifestyle and then stay near to the Lord. We need to be like Job. He said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You know, every time I think about Job and what happened to him, it brings tears to my eyes for his sake. How could that happen to a person who the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? upright man. It makes me angry when I see things like that happen to people. But my brothers and sisters, we know who's responsible for that. What do you want God to say about you? Do you want God to boast about you? Have you considered my servant Hayward? Have you considered any of you that he uses as an example? This is a tough time in Earth's history. So many prophecies are coming true and about to come true. We know that there's but a short time because we've read the end of the book. But we need to trust God. You know, we often talk about Bible characters like Job, like Daniel, like David. 
like Elisha, those who have suffered. In fact, when Daniel was praying for a revelation to know what certain things meant, and he fasted and prayed for 21 days, but it didn't seem apparent that anything was happening for him. But then, an angel, a bright angel, came to him and said, Daniel, your prayers were heard the first day you started praying. But you know what, Daniel? I was tied up, busy fighting the prince of Persia. And in fact, the fight was so ferocious that Michael had to come and help me. So that's why we weren't here sooner. But I heard, I heard you. And when Elisha, Elijah, was being persecuted, and the prophets were being killed. And an angel came to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he says, they're killing the prophets and I'm the only one left. And the angel said to him, there's 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. You're not alone. And as we continue to think about our issues, we're not alone. We are not alone. Does that mean that everything is going to go well for us? Does that mean that we're not going to have trials? We're not going to have confusion in our lives? Doesn't mean that. But we all need help in overcoming our fears, overcoming our anxieties, having peace and contentment, having peace and contentment. When we consider what Jesus Christ has done for us, and he gave up everything for us, just so that you and I can have eternal life and that we could love him. It would be good for me to have all my dreams here on earth. It would be so fine to have everything I want and all of my ducks get lined up in a row. And I plan my life out the way I want it, what feels good to me. But we need more than that. John 14, 27 says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'll conclude with 
one more passage from the Spirit of Prophecy, Ministry of Healing. It says, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of these diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. Disease is sometimes produced and is often greatly aggravated by the imagination. Many are lifelong invalids who might be well if they only thought so. Many imagine that every slight exposure will cause illness and the evil effect is produced because it is expected. Many die from disease, the cause of which is wholly imaginary. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, promote health and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. So are you sick? Are you shut in? Are you hurting? Are you suffering? Grieving? Lonely? Downcast? Confused? I have an appeal today. I want you to know first, though, that no matter what has been happening in your life, mentally, spiritually, physically, God has been with you, and God has been sustaining you. You can fall back in his arms and relax, because why worry? You can't add one hair to your head. God has got you. And he's sustaining you and taking care of you. No matter how bad you've done yourself, he is sustaining you. So I ask the question, do you want to move forward? Do you want to ask Christ for that kind of faith that you can trust and love him? Do you want to purpose in your heart that God will put priorities in your life that you can study and stay close to him and love him for who he is. 
If you want this for your life, will you stand with me? Do you want another chance? You want to be able to start over, as it were, a new beginning. There's no other hope out there, friends, except for that found in Jesus. Is your soul heavy? You've got a problem. And you pray and you pray, asking God to help you with this problem spiritually. You know, one writer said that a lot of times we imagine a lot of sin in our lives. And this writer says, if we feel downcast and depressed because we know we have not been doing what God wants us to do, and that gets us down, then pray, ask for forgiveness, and move on. These issues should not continue to burden us down. In fact, as the spirit of prophecy says, a lot of the sins we think we're committing are imaginary and have been placed there by the enemy. If you can put your finger on something you've done wrong, resolve that between you and God. If it's a vague experience, just in general, you think you're not where God wants you to be, that is from the enemy. God has nothing to do with vagaries like that. The Holy Spirit will point out to you specific things you need to pray for and ask forgiveness for. And if it's vague, don't let that cause you anxiety. Don't let that worry you. Cast it off because it's from the enemy. So from today, we can start over. My second appeal. Comes from the spirit of prophecy itself. Oh, that we could all realize the nearness of heaven on earth. When the earth-born children know it not, they have angels of light as their companions. A silent witness guards every soul that lives, seeking to draw that soul to Christ. As long as there is hope, until men resist the Holy Spirit to their eternal ruin, they are guarded by heavenly intelligences. That's found in Councils for the Church, page 241. She explains, if people could understand that Jesus understands, they will be healed of broken hearts and damaged emotions. If people could understand that Jesus understands, they would be healed of broken hearts and damaged emotions. So I appeal today to those of you who have never followed Jesus as you should have. You want to accept him as your personal savior. 
You want to be able to rely on him to give you peace. You want to be able to rely on him to give you contentment. This can be yours. If this is what you want, you want to be a part of this mission, you want to be a part of this church, I invite you now to come. I invite you to come. It's not too late. No matter how difficult it seems, for you, you can have peace now. We can have contentment now. Is there one who would like to come forward today? We don't have to fight the devil. All we have to do is resist the devil. And he will flee. And we do that through the power of Jesus Christ and his spirit. Is there one? Let us pray. Father, you have said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Father, help us. Give us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Help us to keep our eyes stayed on you. Help us and balance out our emotion. Balance out our anxieties and fears. Father, give us peace. Help us to be content with such things as we have that you've given us already. Allow us to be in good health. Not just for our own benefit, but so that we may have the strength and the mental fortitude to be able to be fit for your service. We pray this prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, who died for us, amen and amen. amen. Let's stand together as we sing our clothing song. Let the church say amen. Church, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen.
Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen and me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Father, we thank you now for your blessings. Help us to go be witnesses for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated.